and thank you all for joining us on our session today. Um, we are honored for this opportunity to host and sponsor our webinar entitled K-12 is the Future Here with our all-star panel of speakers focused on K-12 at the intersection of research, practitioners, and innovation through the lens of pre and post COVID. My name is Mike Cameron, Director of Business Development here at Sway. And before we get started, I'd like to say a few words about Sway 360 Learning. Sway 360 is a comprehensive, all-in-one integrated platform that supports face-to-face, -face, hybrid, and or full online learning, synchronously and asynchronously. Teachers are able to deliver virtual instruction, complete their instructional time, they can track student mastery of assignments and assessments, as well as create engaging and interactive lessons. And perhaps more importantly, engage directly with students and parents, all without having to leave the platform, and all with just one login. The three plus one key components that make Sway 360 stand out among teachers, again, with just one login, teachers have the ability to number one, create and curate content. Number two, manage learners with whole and or small group virtual instruction, remediation and tracking mastery. In addition to number three, managing and delivering virtual instruction with tools like polling, breakout rooms, recording and playing back and sharing virtual classrooms, as well as co-teaching a virtual class. The final component, the one plus key component to the platform is parental engagement. This is where teachers can instantly schedule a virtual meeting with a parent. This provides a direct teacher connection and parents have access to assessments and assignments to know exactly where their child stands at all times. In addition, parents have access to student classes. With Sway 360, you no longer need Zoom or Google Meets. Online video is already built within the platform. Well, in closing, again, thank you all for joining us. Please ask questions during the webinar today and feel free to tweet at Sway360 throughout this event. Our session is being recorded and we'll be sending a copy of the webinar to each of you. I'd like to also announce that we have recently been invited into Digital Promise as a thought partner for their Learner Variability Project. For those not familiar with Digital Promise, it is a nonprofit organization funded through the US Congress for innovation and education on research-based products. Well, we have plans on Jennifer Allen moderating our session today. She had a pet emergency that she had to uh, take care of. So now I would like to introduce our founder and CEO and moderator of today's session, Mr. Jacob McEvoy. Jacob. Hey, Mike, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just for the record, I had to uh, rush into my closet and pull out my, my coat. I was like, oh man, I'm moderating this afternoon, but I am, I am excited and I am thrilled that uh, I, I get to have this opportunity to, to be on a panel and moderate uh, these three amazing thought leaders from across the country. So I wanna take this time and thank you all for partaking in this event. This is a, is a national um, webinar session that we're hosting today. We have attendees from all over the country. It is our, our highest rated right now uh, session. We've had six sessions in the last six weeks and this is the seventh session we're hosting this, uh, this fall and is our highest rated, highest, highest attended. So on this panel, um, uh, on, on this webinar today, we have attendees from all kinds of backgrounds. I mean, you could think of uh, big districts. I think we have somebody from a big, I can't say the name, but we have somebody from a very big district across the nation. So we have suburban districts, rural districts uh, that are represented today. So I'm excited of what you guys will share and your thoughts. Because I think between the three of you, uh, the diversity you bring to the table is, is critical in education with where we are today. You know, you have somebody coming in really with a lens of equity, marginalized population, somebody coming in from a research uh, perspective and somebody coming in from a practitioner perspective, which I think will be critical to our audience to hear what your thoughts are. I, um, before I have you introduce yourselves, I, I wanna share with you a quick story that happened about a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago now, I was at a conference uh, a big national conference, ASU GSV. And uh, in one of the sessions that I attended, the question was presented. And the question was, last year this time, if somebody had asked you the question, where do you think education will be uh, in 30 years? And nobody would give you the response of where it is today. You know, it, it has taken a natural event 
to force uh, us educators to shift, to change, and maybe rethink or reimagine learning. You know, we've had other occurrings around security and uh, threats and shootings, and education did not change. So it had to take a natural event. So these are interesting times across the world in terms of education, how we see education. And then it begs the question, is the future here? Or are we gonna go back to the old or is there a new normal? And I can't wait to hear your thoughts on that topic, on that conversation. Now, what I'd like for you all to do is just quickly introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your background and the work that you've done. I'll start with you, Ms. Gwen Grant. Gwen, we can't hear you. Yep. I always forget that. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am the president and CEO of the Urban League of Greater Kansas City. Uh, my organization, uh, we are a civil rights and community uh, human services organization. We're community based. Uh, we have uh, more than 50 years of history working in public education, primarily uh, advocating for equity in urban education and providing direct services to parents and students. Thank you, Ms. Grant. All right, and I will go to Dr. Tricia Kalela. Hello, my background is in education and in research and in ed tech, having worked with some startups, worked in district roles and formerly a teacher. Uh, right now I work with, with educational technology companies. I work at Digital Promise on the Learner Variability Project, where we focus on the whole learner model. All right, thank you, Dr. Kalela and uh, Dr. Jennifer Burks. Hey, good. it's morning here, so good morning, but I know it's afternoon other places. Um, I am the Associate Superintendent of Technology and Innovation at the Poway Unified School District, located in San Diego, California. We're about uh, 36,500 students. Uh, we span across about 100 miles. Uh, my background is in education and clinical psychology, um, as well as I have a background in um, reading and elementary and middle school education. That's kind of where my focus has been. Oh, thank you. Well, I didn't even know you had a background in clinical psychology. Huh, fantastic. I did. I got uh, seven years at a university uh, in strategies for success and in intro to psychology and spent some time at the sheriff's department. Oh, whoa, whoa. It's, it's getting deeper as we talk. Mm -hmm. But th this is great. I mean, we were just having a conversation early on, I think, with, uh, with Tricia before we got on the call. And I have three kids, as you all know, and the challenges that we're dealing with right now in, in, in their school, right, in terms of are they going to school, are they face-to-face, -face? what's going on? So the question that I have for you to open us this up is what do you think of K-12 education and where it is going? Anybody could uh, open that up? Well, I'll jump in. Um, you know, I, I think that um, certainly where I, what I'll speak to is where it is right now, I think is uh, in a, a state of high stress as, as it adjusts to the current learning environment with uh, having to deal with distance learning. Um, but I think in terms of, of where it is going, my hope is that uh, this, this new reality of having to uh, have technology at the centerpiece of how uh, educators are imparting knowledge that we will be able to take education to a much higher level um, with regard to exposing our K-12 students to uh, technology, training teachers to be more adept at, at uh, using technology uh, relative to education, I'd certainly like to see more innovation in the future, uh, utilizing uh, virtual reality as a, as a way of getting students engaged, because I think there's no substitute really for that person-to-person uh, -person contact, that classroom contact that's necessary for interaction between students and uh, their, their uh, peers, as well as between students and teachers. But when we find ourselves in these environments where we cannot be together, technology through virtual reality can uh, bring uh, uh, you know, an abundance of knowledge and interaction into a new space. That, that is interesting, Gwen, because I mean, when, when you look at uh, industry 
they talk about that we're in now in the fourth industrial age, right? Where you start to look at things like virtual reality, like you just talked about, augmented reality, uh, cybersecurity issues, network effects, and all those pieces. And you start to think about education and how the social piece and the community piece comes into play. Because for example, you think about things like uh, field trips. How, how then would you consider taking field trips? How do those come into play? How do you make sure you're still doing some of those things to provide your students with some exposure? Exactly, I think that that's a way to bridge that gap. The only challenge here is to also, uh, that we have to always be mindful of the economic um, equity issues. So when we're uh, providing, as we upgrade technology, as we are more dependent on technology, uh, to provide quality education for our students, then we also have to be mindful of the digital divide uh, because when the more uh, technology we use, uh, the, uh, that creates uh, an environment for widening the achievement gap because of the students who uh, either do not have access or cannot afford uh, the more expensive approach, you know, or the, or the high cost that technology can Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I, I would like to expound on that later, but I also want to get some thoughts from Jennifer and from, from Tricia. Tricia, what are your thoughts on where education is right now and where it's going? Yes. Um, well, I'm very passionate about VR and AR as well and the potential there. I think that um, there, we're further away from that right now because right now we're really focusing on the needs of the learners. I think that the sh there was a shift initially when, in March where people were really embracing all kinds of technology tools, really open to lots of new ways just to meet the, learner, the needs of the learners where they were. And then over summer and fall, um, it, what ended up happening is people realized it was overwhelming to many of the families. There were many overwhelming pieces. Um, as the adverse experiences were growing and some people were undergoing even more complex trauma for various reasons, it became even more difficult and with working memory and attention and so forth to take on all of these tools. And so many districts had to really contract what they were doing and they narrowed it down to a few. What I'm, what I'm optimistic about is that we're going to go back toward the area where we really look towards the transformation and we're really focusing away from instruction and toward to learning. I think that we're seeing a shift away from what knowledge we can have children come away with to what are our learners coming away with on their own? How much have they become self-directed learners? What is the learner agency that's been built? I think that a lot of, a lot of attention is being given to learning loss. And I think we really need to look at learning gains in terms of what kind of critical thinking skills have learners developed? What kind of self-help skills have they developed that will carry them very far? So I think that the future of education is really going to be very much along the path toward VR and AR, but more of it immediately in a multi-sensory active learning rather than the passive imparting of, of instruction. And I would really love to see the whole concept of school change from where we go to school to learn from mm -hmm. this time to this time. And I think we're seeing that shift right now. And I would love to see that continue to grow and that learning is continuous. Everyone is now a new learner all the adults, all the parents, all the teachers, everyone is now a learner. And I think we're going to see that what really matters in the near future and in the growing future is learner agility, the ability to learn quickly and the ability to pivot and be able to use that cognitive flexibility along the way. So I see those as really positive paths that we're on right now. That's interesting because when you look at education in general as a general statement, it's multi-layered, right? Because you start to think about the way we are funded in education. It's butts in the seats, right? You have to have students in the seat. But things like COVID now are forcing even our legislators to think differently about it. Like, well, how do we fund these students? How do we fund these schools to make sure they still get uh, funded for these students? Now, the second thing you start to find out is even the way we, we measure success, right? We've always used grading systems as the standard, right? You have state tests which are A, B, Cs, and Ds, right? That's how you measure mastery of content or progression. But what you're talking about is, is more than that. It, it's like you go to school to learn. It's almost like competency-based type learning you're describing. Is that, is that a fair assessment? 
Exactly. Much more of a mastery approach, comp competency-based, and the skills that will carry forward so that they transfer to other areas rather than just the knowledge in this one specific area. So do you think the community, the parents will easily adopt that idea? I know COVID right now is forcing us to go in some of these directions, but say in the event that now we have a vaccine in the next six, seven, eight months, and it's national, everybody's getting it or whatever, do you think parents will be able to adapt to that idea of, well, maybe not seeing an A or B is just okay on the report I do, card? I, I do believe so. And we have some counties nearby that are, are helping to move that transformation away from the grading based system that has so many inequalities based in it into a not yet a mastery. Look at what you're learning. After right. all, if we really consider um, educational systems shifting more towards high lows or high impact learning organizations, more of an, eco an ecosystem of learning. If we're focusing on learning, learning involves feedback and reflection and the ability to continuously improve. And those are not embedded in a grading system. Oh my goodness, that's interesting. So Jennifer, I wanna hear from you because you are actually in the building in the school district right now. You're actually an actual practitioner today, uh, managing and working with students and parents and hearing and dealing with all some of these thoughts and ideas that are coming through right now down your pipeline. Right, and I, I think both um, Trisha and Gwen had some really good points uh, that I'd like to touch upon as well. I think the grading piece, as much as I think we would like to see it shift, I think that is a monumental task right now to make that shift uh, into the competency-based type of learning. Um, I'm not sure if that's you know nationwide, but I, I foresee that to be a significant challenge, especially with the colleges and so forth. I think with the elementary schools, we can make that shift a lot easier. And then we transition into that, you know, typically in our middle and high schools. And we've seen that in our district. Um, to address the equity with, you know, during the pandemic and how to support students, I do think we've been able to do things which we were struggling to be able to do um, prior. We've done a lot to bring technology into school districts to build, you know, and support that with equity. I think with some of the changes we've had to really focus on mobile devices how do we support students equitably how do we ensure that we have untethered broadband and connectivity and access across our entire district across 36,500 students in some districts larger and some districts smaller how do we do that how do we make sure that parents have that training because we're talking about our tks we're talking about kindergartners um, so i think we've been able to see some huge successes and advancements around take home programs for technology. We have all of our students taking home devices now, if they need devices. Um, we have been able to move our district to a one-to-one -one district, something that we had struggled with for a very long time, but no, knew it was necessary and, and critical. Um, we've had to really look at how do we support our parents and our students? So some of the things that we looked at putting into place that we had not, we knew it would be good, we just didn't have the resources to do it is, a parent support hotline. How do we let parents pick up the phone, call someone, talk to someone? You know, how do teachers provide office hours? I'm not sure office hours were ever provided, you know, virtually before. So I, I've seen some really neat things in there. How do we ensure digital citizenship and safety and, and we, you know, making sure that that's implemented all the way through and then complement that with the virtual and, you know, augmented reality. Um, we've been using, Google Expedition Kids. It's now just how do we get those during COVID in the hands of kids? What does that look like to be able to do? But we've been doing that with ceramics equipment, with band equipment. You know, we have pickups that have been taking place where students pick up supplies because not all students have the same supplies at home. So it goes back to Gwen's point of how do we make sure that students have the same access to resources uh, regardless of, of their home and, and what they have access to. Um, I think on as far as professional development, we've seen a lot of shifts uh, to Trisha's point. We surveyed our parents in the spring last year during kind of emergency distance learning and said, what went well in your mind? What didn't go well? And that was critical because one of the big things that came out of that was the continuity and the standardization of our platforms. For example, our LMS. We had, school, we had classrooms using anything from, you know, their own website to Google Classroom to our purchased LMS to other LMSs. And so the parents across the board said, we want one place to go. 
And so that allowed us, which we've had, you know, for six years to be able to standardize our platform. Number one request by parents that provided training and so forth. And I think when we talked about professional development, we were able to shift how we do professional development. We were able to do it over web conferencing. We're able to do webinars that are recorded. We're able to do self-paced modules, the micro-credentialing, all of those things that we were looking to move towards. But we have to, as we have to adjust for students on how they learn, we have to adjust that same thing for our teachers. So I think we've seen some some big shifts uh, that we would want to take forward uh, and to continue as, as we get back into uh, the new normal. The new normal. That, that's interesting, right? Because I think um, districts and school systems need to really think differently going into this new future. And I'll tell you why I think that's important. Uh, some of the early data that's coming out right now, a lot of districts are actually losing students, okay? What they're not sure of is where they're losing those students to. So it could be either private schools, homeschooling, or learning pods, or virtual school systems. If you look at the data of virtual school system platforms, their numbers are through the roof, right? Because parents are going, well, if I don't have to send my kid to school and I have a device, I can support that piece of it, I'll make it happen, right? But here's something interesting that's happening in this next legislature that's coming up. A bill right now being presented in the state of Montana around school funding and the argument in the bill is as a parent i should be able to secure federal funding dollars for my students if i choose not to put them in a public school so those dollars will start to follow that student wherever they go including private schools so that's going to be interesting for school systems to really think differently on how they approach education i mean if you're talking about kids of uh, uh, low socioeconomic status and having no access to maybe some field trips. What do those schools offer that are compelling for me as a parent to say, well, I want to put my kid in that school versus putting them in an online school where they'll have access to other resources. So I think an event like COVID is really going to force educators to think differently and start to shift in their way of thinking and approach on how they even, even deliver instruction. Okay. Which, which makes me think of another question that I have. So how do you envision, uh, envision the uh, instruction delivery piece of it? I think, Jennifer, you started kind of alluding to some of that in your, in your talking points there. I think to piggyback off it a little bit, I, I think uh, there's going to be a shift more to, you know, uh, adaptive curriculum. You know, I think that's going to be a, sh a huge piece because it allows... Um, you know, the, the technology adapts to where the students are and, and, and can provide more pinpoint detail to teachers to be able to support where do students need to learn so that we don't all teach the same lesson to all students, even though they may or may not know that. So I think we're seeing a shift to more of that personalized and adaptive curriculum. I think we're seeing a shift to more voice and choice, that there's more learner autonomy and students can have more voice in what they need to learn. Um, I think the hybrid piece is going to be something that is evolving as far as the instruction of uh, the delivery of instruction with the both the asynchronous and the synchronous learning. Um, we've had students who have thrived in the virtual learning environment and we've also had students who have thoroughly struggled and there's been a lot of social emotional challenges and there's been a lot of home challenges and we know that. So I think there's a shift or potential for both that hybrid on campus and off campus. Do you have to be there five days a week? I don't know. Do you need to come in for office hours when you need help? Possibly. So I think there's, there's been a lot of possibilities that can come. And I think it's just how do you create those in your school district and how do we put those together to create different opportunities for students? But I do see virtual learning as an option moving forward, you know, just as some have had you know, home experiences. And I think sometimes parents are now adjusting to having their students home more. And, and that's part of it. Um, I will say as far as the technology, what I've seen is that sometimes technology was used for the sake of technology. And I think with this now, there's been so much screen time and everyone's been far more aware of that, that the technology is more focused, it's more purposeful. And educators are using it to in and integrating it with more meaning uh, than they maybe they had before. So I think uh, 
you know, we have opportunities to see how virtual and hybrid and on-campus learning. Right now, one of the things we're doing in our district is concurrent teaching, yeah. where you are teaching um, both your on-campus students and your virtual students simultaneously. So that is a model that we're working on right now that has been getting a lot of momentum across the nation. And that allows students to determine what works best from them. And, and that can happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Absolutely. I mean, from what you're describing, I mean, it sounds like there, there has to be uh, quite a bit of uh, teacher professional development. Uh, because now we believe, one thing that we believe in its way is that uh, technology in the hands of great teachers can be transformational, right? But what that means is the ability of the teachers to leverage technology to drive outcomes. I mean, in this environment where you're talking about, you know, individualized instruction, personalized instruction. Sounds like to me, there has to be a lot of data-driven decisions, data analytics, understanding performance, where each student is and how best you can help and support them. And then making a decision based on that data to drive instruction and recommend, right? Because if you are having multiple kids on different paths, as a teacher, how do you manage that, right? And I think you have to really depend on your technology to help you make some of those decisions and recommendations and suggestions for your students at different learning paths. Uh, Tricia, what are your thoughts from a technology standpoint as it relates to online uh, instruction delivery? I think one thing that we've, we've really been able to, to realize, recognize, and discover through this whole process is that, that there are some ed tech products out there that are really doing an amazing job with adaptive learning that are built around the learner. And I think historically education has been, has had the focus around the content in that the learner had to adapt to the content versus we're adapting to the learner. And I think that what EdTech has shown us is that it's adapting to the learner and that whole learner experience design that some products are using where they're really embracing a whole learner framework and they're able to ensure that it's not just content that they're delivering or they're trying to help the learner learn even within it's adapted, but they're really looking at the social emotional factors that are embedded in there. The strategies to support social emotional learning are embedded in the platform as well. Strategies to support cognitive supports and strategies to support um, some of the background of the learners themselves are all embedded in there. So you have more of a whole child approach. So it's more learner centered. And I think that what we need in education is to really be able to make that shift in a solid way and consistently moving forward that we're really focusing and it's everything is learner first. So in ed tech, we call it learning experience design. And I think in education, we want to call it learner experience design. What do we know about our learners and how do we build from there? How do we adapt the curriculum and the learning for the learners rather than expecting them to adapt to what we have already created? Much like what Jennifer was speaking to as well. That's good. That's good, Tricia. Now, uh, Gwen, from your perspective, as you start to think about some of your student populations, the students that you work with, the parents and the communities that you engage, how do you envision this new instruction delivery piece going forward and really thinking about parental engagement in that process? Yeah, I, I think that um, uh, when I, to Jennifer's point around the concurrent teaching uh, aspect of it, I think that's, that's been one, what I see parents who are, in, who are dealing with distance learning really like the concurrent uh, teaching strategy, especially for uh, the younger children. So they're able to be interactive with the classroom while they're at home. And that relieves the burden on the parent as well, uh, which didn't occur in the first phase of, of the lockdown and uh, when uh, parents were dealing with um, having to struggle with how are they going to support um, distance learning and having multiple platforms and assignments that were coming from the schools and it was just a total nightmare and I think that what's really important for our school administrators to consider is as they envision instruction uh, delivery that they do it through try to do it through the lens of, of the end user of the parent and the student. And most often what we find is, is uh, teachers and administrators are so insular in their thinking about how they're going to uh, provide education that they forget about all of the other challenges that take place in the household. 
So as we look to having to deal with hybrid uh, uh, models or concurrent uh, teaching models, we really do need to think, okay, how is this going to impact the parent? Because the parent is gonna have to play a, a, a leading role. And uh, educators are always talking about the importance of parental in, engagement, and we need parents to be more involved, then you might wanna start with parents uh, asking them, what is the best way for us to, uh, you know, to, to support you and for you to support us all in the best interest of educating your child? Uh, so this, the, there needs to be instruction for the parents. Mm. There needs to be some um, training for parents so that they know how to engage with the teacher uh, in these various models. Mm -hmm. How can we monitor? How can they support? Um, this, that's what I love about Sway 360 is that parents are built into that platform. There's an opportunity for them to uh, observe instruction, uh, but they also need to be have an opportunity to get a full understanding of what lessons are being taught. Mm. You know, we want parents to help kids learn, and then this is all new. The, the longer we're away from school and we're into our careers, and then we look at some of these assignments and go, I have no clue. But if I can actually observe instruction uh, when, the, when, the, when the teacher is teaching a lesson, then I can better support my child. So I think that's, you know, the important thing is, is focusing on parent, parental engagement and making sure that it is interconnected that it is a part of the planning process yeah. and not the secondary thought yeah you're, you're absolutely correct gwen because we've always known that the, the parents are a key stakeholder in the kids education in the child's education and even in, in title funding uh, from the federal government there's an allocation i think it's up, up to 15 percent they say that should be allocated for parental engagement um, but now the data is showing us that now more than ever Parents are totally involved in their kids' learning. I think because they're all at home, they're, they're having to deal. I'm, I'm dealing with, okay, I got three kids, okay? I'm, I'm involved in everything now. I mean, I'm sure the teachers hate me now. Like, oh my gosh, what, what, what is this? Because I'm in it now. I'm involved in that. Now, Jennifer, let me ask you this question from a district perspective. Are you seeing your parental engagement kind of go up those numbers? Are they now more engaged in, in their students' learning? I would say yes. I mean, parents have to be, you know, I mean, just think, you know, a, a kindergartner who's first day on campus and it's, they're virtual and they have technology or, you know, a third grader, you know, who hasn't used some of the ed tech tools and programs are now expected to log into a Chromebook and they're expected to get to an LMS and they're expected to then get to, you know, a learning program. That's a lot. So one of the things we launched this year were parent academy videos mm. and for parents and so we took all of we we looked at all of the programs as we all know there's hundreds to thousands of educational technology programs we looked at those um, that's where analytics really come in to support and look at the data of how are these programs being used we implemented and, and recommended during our professional development about two handfuls of those based on grade level specifics right and we provided support for the parents this is how you learn. This is how you log into it. This is how you log into a Chromebook. This is how you get your password. Everything from that to what is this program? What would what is Seesaw? What does it do? How do you use it? What is it beneficial for? What is this program? It's our computer adaptive program. So we provided short videos, um, both in English and Spanish for our families to be able to learn how to use these programs because to a lot of parents, it's jargon. It's a word they've never heard of and it you know, doesn't mean anything. And so we wanted to put meaning so that they could buy into and, and build their understanding of these programs to be able to support their children. Uh, but I think absolutely parents are much more involved. I know with my own, I'm far more involved um, because you're right, you, you have to be. They're, they're home and you know when you sent them off to class, you assume they got all their questions answered and they came home with already the knowledge to do their homework because it was an extension of the school day. And now, you know, it's easy, it's easy to get distracted or grab your phone if you've got an older student who's in high school who thinks they're listening and they're multitasking and maybe they shouldn't be multitasking as much as they think they should be. <laughs> right, and they right. can help, you know, but I think you also have these amazing resources. We know YouTube is the number one place kids go for homework help, you know, and, and you've got these resources. So I think we're seeing a lot of, of that. Um, and, and I think that's for the positive.
You know, yeah. I think sometimes it can be challenging that parents are overly involved, but I think for the most part, this is the first time that parents have really seen what's been going on on a regular basis in, in their kids' classrooms. And, and for the most part, I think they are pleasantly pleased. Um, they're seeing the rigor that's taking place and, you know, they wanna be part of that. And, and we always call that that three-legged stool, you know, parent, student, you know, teacher. And, and that's what we wanna do is to be able to use all those resources to support the students. That is fantastic. I think, uh, and I'll say it right now for the record, I think our teachers are superheroes, okay? They, they all have capes on them. I mean, the stuff that they have to deal with and manage on a daily basis, I couldn't do it. So thank you to all of our teachers out there. Now, now Trisha, question for you is, is you start to think about the work that you do because with Digital Promise, you're really at the intersection of research practitioners and innovation. Uh, but it was, you look at school leaders, what should they be thinking about as they look at now and think about ahead? I think really trying to figure out what, uh, what systems and policies, procedures might have been in place previously and have been in place for many, many years, but now we're realizing maybe standing in the way of moving forward based on what we now know our learners can do, some equity issues, all of those other things. There are many practices that have been in place that are not productive and, and are not going to be as purposeful moving forward. And the, the forward thinking school districts that I've been working with across the nation are having, they're doing an amazing job of really analyzing, sitting down and having a lot of focus groups with parents, focus very inclusive where the parents and the learners themselves are coming into the conversation and they're having discussions around what is it that's holding your child back from learning from the parent perspective? What's holding your child back from from learning from the teacher perspective and then from the learners, what's holding you back? And then analyzing and cross aligning that with some policies and practices to identify which ones might need some transformation there. Because from that level, if we can't change the system and we can't exp expand into more of an ecosystem viewpoint of learning, then everything could very well go backwards instead of forwards. And so I think that that's one of the biggest things to consider um, from both the research standpoint and the ed tech standpoint, because the technology will, will, will come into play as well. On that, another piece that I think is really important that um, the research has shown um, that we work really closely on is a whole learner model and how, how very important, and Gwen touched it, Gwen discussed it very well, the social emotional learning pieces and the children who have adverse experiences, those really, really will hinder the learning. And so the content does not really matter because if the working memory is being taxed because of these other issues, it won't carry forward. And so what is it that we have in, in our current systems or what do we need to develop to better provide social supports or, or help them with the relationship skills, even for virtual learners, I mean, for both virtual learners and in-person learners. And I think that the last piece is that um, I've been fortunate to have been um, involved in many conversations across the nation um, with families to hear their perspective in these different research groups on, on what is exactly going on and what really is the biggest pain point that you wish could be solved. And consistently, it's a, a clear communication channel that is responsive. So they might, in some families, they have access to it. One teacher will, have, will allow email, but then they don't respond. Another one, you have to go through the school secretary. Another one, a teacher will let you do text messages to them. And so that one's really successful. And so having a, a, a way for them to be able to clearly communicate and get a response back when they're not sure for simple things. The one thing that I heard the most in all the conversations when you hear the parents speaking with the children and everyone's involved in the same conversation is the children will participate in distance learning and they'll hear the instructions and then they go to do the work and they remember parts of it they think they finished the assignment they'll turn it in the parent will get a notification it's incomplete and so then the child's saying, but I turned it in. And it was because the child forgot some part of the instruction. And then when it's pushed out in a typical LMS, the instructions are not there and the parents weren't there. And so then if the parent, so for the, for the it adds more stress to the family who is truly the ecosystem of learning right now. And when that happens, now you have more compounded adverse experiences because the social supports can break down in the family. Whereas if you just had a clear communication channel where the teacher could just say, what exactly is that assignment I'm struggling with, then it would really eliminate so many different, way, different um, 
issues that can really build the social support. And so there's so many other pieces that are in there, but there are little pieces that that at a district level, school level, teacher level, classroom level can can really help but make a big difference in terms of the whole learner and the, and their ability to really learn. I 100% agree with you. Uh, I, I would argue, maybe this is a, is a biased opinion, but I would argue and say most of these legacy products that are out there in the market today that are being used for virtual and online instruction were truly not designed and developed for that. I believe it's a band-aid that school systems took the easy way out, the comfortable thing that didn't have to go to the board and the board would just check that box because we know them, check that box, let's do that. But they were not truly designed for online instruction. So they have those gaps that you're describing that cause a frustration. You know, that's the reason why then you see a lot of students spending a lot of time on things like YouTube and Khan Academy to supplement for that gap right it's happening now one of the things you talked about was taking a look and reviewing policies and systems and procedures right because now we have to rethink all of that even data security even FEPA law i think at some point we have to take a look at FEPA and what's being shared online and how is that being protected because some of these companies have their servers outside of the u.s that's a threat you know so we gotta have to think about that and figure out okay how do we engage with this with these organizations but even on, on the parental side of the piece that you described again is like what resources are being given to parents to support their learners as part of this ecosystem, right? Uh, Gwen, what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, I love everything Tricia said. It was, I mean, it was just all uh, right on point with the feedback uh, that we get from parents. And uh, when they talk about these experiences with, with digital learning, um, and so I think that um, that school leaders really should be thinking about um, how they are retraining educators on a number of levels, not just, I mean, of course, in terms of instruction and how to, how to best maximize uh, technology in, during, you know, in, in uh, instructional delivery, and that be that in the classroom or in a digital um, environment, uh, that they embed in this, in this model a focus on culturally relevant pedagogy and uh, how do you ap apply culturally uh, relevant pedagogical frameworks uh, using technology because that's going to increase uh, the uh, level of engagement and uh, learning from students of color particularly. Uh, and so that's really important. Uh, but to the point about engaging parents and using technology to engage parents, uh, school leaders really need to rethink uh, just even what is their real philosophy or what do they really want when they talk about parental involvement? Or do you want an involved parent or do you want an engaged parent? Because the engaged mm -hmm. parent can be somewhat of a nuisance if you, you know, if you truly, if you, you, when you think about it, because an right. engaged parent is going to want to be in the classroom sometime. An engaged parent is going to want to push back when they see like, okay, this, uh, I don't believe these assignments are bringing the academic, the level of academic rigor that I think my child needs to thrive. Um, I want to be engaged uh, and have a relationship with the teacher versus uh, how many teachers are showing up for uh, parent-teacher conferences, you know? So, and then you show up for a parent-teacher conference, but it's not a quality engagement. It's you're waiting online to have five or 10 minutes with the teacher so they can check that off the box that you showed right. up. And our schools, yeah, we have good parental involvement because we had, you know, this number of parents show up. But did that really uh, translate into an engaged parent that can help that child to thrive academically? Is that, is, is, is the connection there where the teacher and the parent are in sync about where the kid is now and where the kid needs to be by the end of that school term? Mm -hmm. So rethinking that relationship building and teachers need to be trained on how to be much more collaborative and engaging in partnerships with parents uh, versus they just want them to show up maybe for a field trip Bake sale, come to the conference, but don't get too much involved in what we're doing right. in the classroom because you don't really know anything about that. But right. now the pandemic is, is showing us is that 
you need parents more than ever to help you meet the, the needs of the children and the demands of the, uh, you know, that are on your district to meet your performance uh, outcomes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think, partner. Right, right. I think that one of the things I talk about industry from an industry perspective and, and the use of data, understanding what's going on, data, machine learning, and AI, which almost gives you predictive analysis, right? is one of the things that I think Digital Promise you guys are doing, Trisha, you could talk to this more than I can, is what Gwen just described of understanding each learner and where they are on their background. So the lessons that the teachers are delivering online are not just the generic one class, fit, one lesson fits all, right? Is you have to take into consideration some specific things on the front end and develop specific strategies to be able to deliver instruction. Trisha, you want to talk about some of the work you do at Digital Promise around that? I think it's absolutely critical in this new environment that these lessons that are being built in these different platforms across the country are not taking this into consideration. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why students are still not getting it and are struggling at home because there's a gap. Trisha? Well, they don't show up. I just want to throw that. that oh, are yeah. they not showing up online because they're not interested. And they're not engaged. Engagement is not there. Right. Sorry. Sure. sure. The, what's really been most exciting the last few months is seeing a lot of the ed tech companies really embracing, first of all, to, to your point, Gwen, really embracing the, the families and making sure that the family uh, dashboard, the parent dashboard matches the teacher dashboard so that when they're having conversations, parents don't have to take screenshots and send them to the teachers, which was also a frustrating um, pain point. So some of those different things have been taken care of. But what's really exciting is to see what they really are doing with AI. And so when you work with the ed tech companies and you're able to, there are a couple I'm thinking of in my mind right now, one in particular that's done an extraordinary job of really breaking down um, what are the competencies that the learners are trying to learn and then what are the dependencies? So what, how would you take those competencies, break those down into the, to the small little nuggets of information? And then where, do, where are the learners really strong? And it, that's from a content perspective. So that would be a content one, but you can look at where the strengths are and you can figure out where the bricks, like if you have a foundation, you consider like a brick wall and you have these, these holes, it can, the, the AI on the back end can actually provide the recommendations for where the learner needs to have some reinforcement. And so right. it will direct them exactly where to go for that reinforcement to make sure that foundation is solid before moving on and ensuring that the conceptual understanding is there rather than being able to just get to answers and, and so forth. So I think that's a beautiful space, really focusing on conceptual understanding and being able to break that down. Another space, another product that I've been working really closely with um, that is doing an amazing job with AI and, and we'll be using some more machine learning and once there's more data and so forth is is really how you can look at a learner profile which is what you were talking to, to Jacob how you can how you can look at a learner profile from a holistic view of the learner not the just the content so what are the different factors at different developmental levels and like like Jennifer my background's in psychology as well so I love looking at all of the the way people think and the and all of those those elements and so when you use a whole learner framework and you can you consider the whole learner, what is it that the learners, as they're answering and providing information through the digital platform, the AI is able to actually subcategorize that because of the way it's been organized, the algorithms running on the back end, it can actually feed information back to the learner that will help propel them in other ways that they might need. So it can help develop that social emotional learning through relationship skills they need. It can help develop some of the metacognition that they might, um, that they might just be, it might be emerging. The AI can feed them what they need. So it's very scaffolded. And it, then it can present it all in a whole learner framework to the learner where it's comprehensible. And it's comprehensible to the parent and it's comprehensible to the teacher. And having been a teacher myself, it's impossible for any teacher, regardless of how gifted you could be, to have your own data dashboard in your head of where all these other children are across different platforms, across different information. 
and be able to consolidate all of that on a learner level. And that's really what the beauty, of, the beauty of AI and ML has, is we can really look at the individual learner, we can really hone in holistically to where they are, where are their strengths, build from an asset model instead of a deficit lens, and ensure that we're really building to support all the learner variability across all those factors. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Tricia. Jennifer, what do you think leaders, school leaders should be thinking about as they look at now and as they look ahead? I think, um, I think there were some great points but made by both uh, Tricia and, and Gwen on that, and, and I completely agree. I think as we continue to look ahead, I, I think we need to take what we've learned from, you know, all of these perspectives during, you know, this pandemic and, and look at that holistically of how we can move forward and how we can continue to innovate, supporting our students from, from meeting them at their needs and meeting them at their levels. And we've done that a lot with our professional development for teachers is meeting them at where they're at so that we're really in that zone of proximal change, which I know Vygotsky has the zone of proximal development. We've shifted that last word a little bit so that, you know, there's, there's a little bit of, I'm not creating too much anxiety, but I'm giving you a little bit of discourse so that we can really push your pedagogical thinking and your instructional practice and what that looks like. And in this new environment, I think it continues to evolve. Um, and I think we also need to look at how can we support the whole learner? How can we look at, you know, preparing them for a future that is unknown? I right. mean, who would have known that we were, you know, going to be in virtual learning. So it's not about necessarily preparing them for, you know, yes, college and career, but unknown. We don't know. And how do we do that? And how do we support their social emotional needs? How do we support their academic needs? How do we support, you know, um, based on their strengths, interests, and, and aspirations and, and provide that and, and support them so that they're ready for their future. And if that's part of, you know, some of the work we've been doing in our district around the world of work and being able to look at career strengths and assessments and interest and, and all of those pieces and provide them opportunities that they may not have typically had. I think we're moving in the right direction. That's, that's fantastic. I mean, the, the thing that I keep hearing, obviously, because that's what, where we are now, is the, the, the role that technology will play in this environment. But obviously we, we know that there are other populations and other students and other families out there that really do not have access to technology at all. I'm, not, I'm talking about as basic as Wi-Fi access at home. You're not even talking about a device, you're talking about just Wi-Fi access at home. So if, if school buildings uh, are just now becoming structures where that house something because kids don't go there anymore to learn right because now learning is taking place anyway this creates a huge digital divide in this new environment how do we bridge that gap gwen <laughs> That's your work every day. I know you, you talk know, about this every day. I know I do. Um, you know that it's really a, it's really a tough one, um, but it, it requires a lot of community collaboration, which is what we've been doing here in Kansas City. Is there we have a digital inclusion network and um, digital equity task forces. We have a lot of groups coming together just to try to figure this out. So it, it uh, for us it's it starts with. Uh, a lot of uh, data analysis and research as to where uh, where are the digital deserts? Um, how do we bridge this gap relative to household uh, brown, uh, you know, broadband access? Uh, and we have still a huge hurdle uh, to surmount to get to a place where all uh, children in urban and rural communities have broadband access. So right. what we've done, the Band-Aid approach has been just putting uh, resources into ensuring that every child has a mobile device and every child who does not have uh, broadband in the household has a hotspot. Right. Uh, but, there, then, but that also creates uh, a divide because the hotspot is not giving you the same quality or the same speed, the uploads and downloads speeds. And if you're doing uh, some type of a project or a presentation, then there, that creates a, a somewhat of a, of a gap between the haves and the have nots relative to uh, how technology is utilized and who has access to it. Um, so uh, we, we've been 
uh, being uh, playing a major advocacy role in trying to um, secure both public and private funding uh, right. to address the needs on, a, on an urban and rural level. Uh, the pandemic did uh, provide for some resources to come into our uh, communities through the CARES Act in funding to school districts to purchase um, devices and, and hotspots. And then we're right. also working on uh, with through our uh, through through the city and other uh, public entities to see about getting uh, the um, uh, internet providers to bring um, services to expand in terms of providing broadband access at a um, at a uh, reduced rate and having some subsidy uh, to support funding for that. Uh, but it's just, it takes some multiple strategies, widespread um, uh, community involvement and, uh, and partnerships, both you know, public-private partnerships to, right. to address it. And we need actually federal legislation. There needs to be some federal dollars flowing into states to uh, address broadband uh, access. It is, mm. you know, we really think that it should be, it's more of a utility than it is, uh, you know, a choice or a luxury. It's just like water, gas. I mean, and this right. is, you know, we need, every, every household needs to have broadband. Period. Right, <laughs> right. Jennifer, how are you uh, addressing this in your environment and from an educator's think, perspective? Yeah. I think one of the things you touched on, Gwen, that is interesting is, we ha we've done a similar, we provided hotspots, um, you know, where there's a, you know, year of service that goes along with it. But then what happens after that? You know, we did use some of the CARES funding. We have partnered with uh, some of our cities uh, who have supported some hotspots as well. But then what happens, you know, because I do think this has changed education forever and what that looks like. So how do we ensure that our students have broadband or internet access moving forward past this time where we have the funding to do that because not every district and we're one of those don't have the funding to keep up you know hundreds and hundreds of hotspots across the entire district for all of our students who need that um, some of our service providers have discounted those rates but that doesn't mean that every family can still access those for a variety of reasons and so I, I think that's a big question moving forward is how do we get you know, partners and legislature around ensuring that we have access for all students across the board, not just right now, but in the future. So um, we've done the same. We've been able to be fortunate to use some of the CARES Act to be able to purchase technology. We had been purchasing that through what we called our modernization plan. We had been moving in this direction. This allowed us to, um, be able to supplement with the devices that we were lacking across the district to support truly a TK through 12 model, right. as well as ensure that the teachers had a laptop, uh, a little bit different than students having a Chromebook across the district to be able to support students from their environment as well. And then also to now to support the concurrent teaching model, because that right. is part of our recommendations on the concurrent teaching model. So teachers aren't necessarily tethered to a desktop computer as well. So, um, I think it's it's looking at that. I think it's continuing to be able to partner with parents. Um, I really liked what you shared about the involvement versus engagement. I 100% I agree with that. So how do we continue to engage our parents and bring them along with us? And how do we continue to provide that professional development? You know, to students need it too. How do we help students to integrate and We've been doing something where we've been having our tech and innovation coaches going into classrooms for the last four years to support not only the teacher, but the students to build their um, self-efficacy and, and knowledge around technology and integrating technology. And what we heard is from those classrooms, the transition when we did go virtual last March was far more seamless, mm. you know, with that additional support that had been taking place. So we've, we've looked at how do we now shift that? How do we provide those office hours? So a teacher could call in and schedule a time with a coach to get those individual questions answered. Cause really right now, who do they ask? Right. You know, how do we, how do we provide them that support and how do they get that support? So they really do feel supported because this is a huge shift and they've been doing amazing jobs. So how do we continue to support them? 
right. uh, moving forward. And how do we also do that in a way where it doesn't have to necessarily be a phone call? How can we continue to do that through social media? You know, we've launched things called bite-sized learning. And so it's little tips. It's not a lot. It's not overwhelming, but it's continuing to put, move the needle to provide some of those supports for, you know, all of our um, stakeholders throughout right. the district. Well, thank you, thank you so much. Oh my goodness, we're already at time. But uh, I wanna take, before I pass this back to Mike, I wanna take this opportunity and thank you all. This was an interesting, very engaging conversation. I know we could go on forever. And some of the ideas and thoughts that have come out, I'm sure all of our attendees are walking away with some good nuggets of things they're thinking about, some challenging thoughts that they may wanna implement and maybe reach out to you at some point. But thank you all to our panelists and I'll pass it back to Mike. Mike. Yeah, thank you, Jacob. And thank you um, to all of our presenters that made this webinar possible. Um, thank you, Jacob, for filling in at the last minute. And thank you all for joining us today. And, and remember, each of you will receive a copy of today's session. Um, have a great day and be on the lookout for future webinars throughout the school year. Have a great day. Goodbye.